on World News Tonight. Fake threats. Despite being the most infectious variant at the moment, Omicron may not be as dangerous as it seems as the WHO breaks new ground on the properties of the strain. Tonight, the new information. Ground Zero. India, which once a COVID hub grapples to cope, a fresh fourth wave as curfews imposed in its capital Delhi to take control of the spread. Health officials tonight pleading with the residents to take precautionary measures. Whirling the unrest. Protest in Kazakhstan becomes violent as police clashes with the public in the nation's biggest city. The current government steps down due to a fuel crisis that has put the Central Asian nation in turmoil. Beijing to blossom. The games once boycotted by many prepares for the show of the year. This is other than a world news tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. As we begin tonight's broadcast, we have breaking news. Italy's lower chamber of parliament set January 24th as the start date due to begin voting for a new president, officially kicking off a campaign that is expected to see Premier Mario Draghi and ex-Premier Silvio Bolsconi vie for the prestigious job. The election of a new president of the Republic may have major repercussions for the future of Prime Minister Mario Draghi's government, which is trying to contain a wave of COVID-19 infections. Draghi has made clear he would like to become president, bringing to an end his 11-month-old government and leaving the country with the choice of either installing a new premier or holding elections a year ahead of schedule. However, there is no guarantee the 74-year-old former European Central Bank chief will get the job. The president, elected for a seven-year term, normally has a largely ceremonial role but enjoys extensive powers following election or when a government falls. He has the final say in nominating the prime minister and other cabinet members. Now we move on to the updates of the COVID crisis around the world. Neighbouring India is bracing for a third wave of coronavirus as its largest cities, the capital Delhi and financial hub Mumbai, see a surge in cases. India reported over 58,000 cases, a six-fold rise in a week that experts say is fooled by the Omicron variant. Nearly a third of the whole infections came from Delhi and Mumbai. Both cities have brought back curfews and other restrictions to halt the spread of the virus. The head of the India's vaccine task force mentions that the third wave of the pandemic had already begun in the country, adding that the whole wave seems to be driven by the new variant. The country has reported more than 2,000 Omicron cases. Maharashtra, of which Mumbai is the capital, is leading the tally followed by Delhi. The All India Institute of Medical Sciences, one of India's major hospitals in Delhi, has cancelled winter leave for doctors. The rising infections are a somber reminder of the devastating second wave India faced in April and May. Daily average of about 400,000 cases at the peak of the crisis. There are new clues as to why the Omicron variant may produce milder COVID-19 symptoms despite being more transmissible. Several recent studies have looked at the effects of the virus on mice and hamsters, have found that the Omicron variant leads to a lower viral load on the lungs. More evidence is emerging that the Omicron coronavirus variant causes milder symptoms, a World Health Organization official said on Tuesday. Evidence suggests that the variant affects the upper respiratory tract and that symptoms are less severe compared to previous variants. WHO incident manager Abdi Mahmoud explains. We are seeing more and more studies pointing out that Omicron is infecting the upper part of the body. Unlike other ones, the lung who has been causing severe pneumonia. It can be a good news, but we really require more studies to prove that. Since the heavily mutated variant was first detected in November, WHO data shows it has spread quickly and emerged in at least 128 countries. But while case numbers have surged to all-time records, the hospitalization and death rates are often lower than at other phases in the pandemic. We had a good number of studies coming up, proving again what we had from South Africa, that the vaccine still protects you against hospitalization and severe disease and death. And that's what vaccines were designed. The challenge has not been the vaccine, but the vaccination and reaching those vulnerable populations. 
However, Mahmoud also sounded a note of caution when relying on data just from South Africa, as it has a young population among other factors. He also warned that Omicron's high transmissibility meant it would become dominant within weeks in many places, posing a threat to medical systems in countries where a high proportion of the population remains unvaccinated. Asked about whether an Omicron-specific vaccine was needed, Mahmoud said it was too early to say, but voiced doubts and stressed that the decision required global coordination. As the world is grappling to cope with the spread of the Omicron variant, yet another variant has emerged in France. It has almost as many mutations as Omicron. According to experts, there's not enough available information to determine if it's more contagious or dangerous than other strains. Researchers at the Méditerranée Infection University Hospital Institute, or IHU, recently discovered a new strain of COVID-19 in the south of France and this variant has now grabbed the world's attention. The variant, first reported on December 10th, has been tentatively dubbed variant IHU. It reportedly carries 46 new mutations, as well as 37 deletions, and has so far been found in at least 12 patients in the region. The index case was detected in a man who had been to Cameroon in November, leading scientists to believe the new strain is of Cameroonian origin. It also shares certain mutations present in other variants, which could make it spread more easily or be tougher to cure. As of now, there's no concrete evidence that it has spread outside of southern France. Neither are there any signs it's outcompeting the Omicron variant, which has become the dominant strain in France and several other countries worldwide. Some experts believe the new strain will struggle to outcompete Omicron, an idea pushed by Imperial College London virologist Dr. Tom Peacock, who said it, quote, actually predates Omicron. Despite several new strains cropping up over the past year, only a few were eventually found to be more contagious or lethal. Details on the new variant were posted online by IHU but have not yet been published in an academic medical journal and the World Health Organization has yet to declare it a variant of interest or concern, or give it a Greek letter name. In the United States now, daily cases are surpassing one million in the midst of a critical shortage of COVID tests. Meanwhile, President Biden addressed the nation in an attempt to reassure Americans amidst the surging cases. These coming weeks are going to be challenging. U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday tried to reassure Americans that the country could weather a record-smashing surge in cases of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through it together. But Biden pleaded with the country to comply with health advisories on vaccinations and masks. For God's sake, please take advantage of what's available. The president said that cases of the Omicron variant were likely to rise a day after the United States reported almost one million new coronavirus cases. That single-day record is almost double the country's previous record of just over 500,000, set just a week ago as the infectious variant shows no sign of slowing. And as cases surge to never-seen-before levels, hospitalizations are rising too, most strikingly among those who remain unvaccinated. Analysis showed more than 100,000 people now hospitalized with COVID-19, up almost 50 percent from a week ago. Unvaccinated are taking up hospital beds and crowding emergency rooms and intensive care units. Pediatric cases are also hitting new records, and the unrelenting surge has prompted more than 3,200 schools to close their buildings this week, according to a site that tracks school disruptions. We know that our kids can be safe when in school, by the way. That's why I believe schools should remain open. Biden said schools could remain open safely if they took the proper precautions. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said that England could withstand a surge in COVID-19 infections without shutting down the economy as Britain reported another record daily high in cases and travel industry groups have called for all remaining COVID restrictions on travellers to be removed in the latest government review. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Dilini Senwi Ratna who joins us now from London in the United Kingdom. Dilini. Yes, Shanali. With data suggesting 1 in 25 people in the UK currently have the virus, airlines say passenger testing is having no real impact. 
It is thought ministers are finalizing changes to guidance on COVID testing. The travel industry said compulsory testing for UK arrivals and departures had held back the sector's recovery. The Prime Minister will meet his cabinet later and urge them to back his decision not to impose any further COVID restrictions in England. The government is discussing the removal of advice that people who test positive on a lateral flow device should seek a confirmatory PCR test. Boris Johnson said he hoped the country could ride out the current wave, although he acknowledged parts of the NHS would feel temporarily overwhelmed. The government has said it continued to keep all measures under review. Currently, all travellers to the UK aged 12 and over have to show proof of a negative test, which can be a PCR or lateral test, and must be taken up to two days before departure for the UK. Back to you, Shivali. All right, thank you. That was Adhita World News Special Correspondent Dil Nisenvi Ratna reporting from London in the UK. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News tonight. North Korea fired an as yet unidentified projectile off its coast. It's believed to have been a ballistic missile and if so, would be the f North's first missile launch of the new year. It's not yet been confirmed, but a ballistic missile launch would also be a violation of the UN security resolutions. On the other hand, international organizations remain ready to provide humanitarian support to North Korea. That includes more than 8 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines. Meanwhile, the regime still claims to have zero coronavirus cases. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says it hopes to see its staff return to North Korea as early as possible following the lifting of movement restrictions. An OCHA spokesperson said on Monday that it is a crucial that international staff return to North Korea to have access to project implementation sites and initiate capacity building activities that have been stalled since 2020. UN member states have agreed not to publish their North Korea support plan due to the lack of access to new verifiable data, but the UN official noted the global body is still planning for humanitarian cooperation in the North this year in line with its global guidelines. While the UN remains in close contact with experts in the regime, the spokesperson reiterated the UN's readiness to give support whenever the situation allows. That's a similar message to the one coming from the COVAX facility on the same day. A COVAX spokesperson said that COVAX and the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization are continuing their dialogue with the North to put into operation their support to Pyongyang. COVAX allocated around 1.3 million additional COVID-19 vaccine doses to the North last December, bringing the organization's total offer to over 8.1 million doses. That's enough to fully inoculate 16% of the population. Pyongyang is yet to accept. Quoting the World Health Organization on Monday, NK News, a U.S. website on North Korea, said the North has conducted COVID tests on around 50,000 people since the beginning of the pandemic, only to find out no one has been infected. The president of Kazakhstan has declared a two-week state of emergency in the Central Asian nation's biggest city, Almaty, as rare protests that began over a sharp rise in fuel prices extended into a fourth day. The protests turned violent and demonstrations have forced their way into a government building in Almaty. This comes as the government of the country announced its resignation. The Kazakh government resigned on Wednesday as protests erupted across the country over a fuel price hike. Police clashed with protesters in the nation's biggest city, Almaty. And security forces fired tear gas and stun grenades to stop hundreds of people from storming the mayor's office. In a video message to the country on Tuesday, President Kasim Jomart Tokayev urged protesters to behave rationally. Calls to attack the government and military buildings are completely illegal. This is a crime that could be punished. The government will not fall but we want mutual trust and dialogue rather than conflict. Many Kazakhs fill their cars with liquid petroleum gas because price caps keep it cheaper than gasoline. But the government lifted those caps over the weekend, arguing that the low price was unsustainable. In response to protests, the government did a U-turn and announced it was restoring the price cap to less than half the market price. But that hasn't stopped the protests. On Wednesday, Deputy Alihan Smailov was appointed as acting prime minister. 
And the president's office has issued a state of emergency and said Almaty and the western Mangistau province would be put under curfew and movement restrictions for two weeks. Dissent is rare in the oil-rich Central Asian nation, as public protest is illegal without notice. A gunman ambushed Haiti's Prime Minister and acting President Ariel Henry in a failed assassination plot just months after assassins killed Haiti's last president in his own home. The shocking new video emerging. <laughs> Haitian Prime Minister and acting President Ariel Henry and his security team coming under heavy gunfire on Saturday in an assassination attempt at an event commemorating the country's Independence Day. His team can be seen trying to shield him with a bulletproof vest while scrambling to take cover behind a vehicle. Then, with gunfire still erupting, the group in a dash running to their caravan of vehicles. The car is speeding away, the prime minister safe inside. Local media reports saying one person was fatally shot, two injured, but an official casualty count has not been released. The gunman still unknown. The prime minister's office saying that, quote, bandits and terrorists had tried to shoot Henri. This comes just months after the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse back in July by a group of armed men. Prime Minister Henri became the de facto leader of the country less than two weeks later. Haitian authorities have arrested 18 Colombians and two Haitian Americans in connection with Moïse's killing. But just this week, another suspect was detained by U.S. authorities in Panama. Gang violence, kidnappings, bloody protests over food and fuel shortages, and a devastating earthquake last year have shaken the vulnerable Caribbean nation to its core. And now, another blatant attack to the country's highest office as the nation struggles to rebuild. A fire that devastated South Africa's parliament has been contained after a two-day battle as a suspected arsonist appeared in court to face charges of, the st of starting the blaze. This is the 49-year-old man accused of setting South Africa's parliament building on fire, which completely destroyed its lower house National Assembly chamber. The chamber was destroyed after flare-up on the second day. The suspect's son, Dele Christmas Mafe, appeared in court on Tuesday to face five charges, including arson and possession of an explosive device. His lawyer said he denied the accusations and would plead not guilty. Mafe was ordered to be held in custody for seven days until January 11th for a bail hearing. Prosecutors said they would oppose bail. Authorities have not disclosed any possible motive for setting the blaze. A fire initially broke out on Sunday. By Monday, authorities had withdrawn some fire trucks and said they were putting out embers. But flames flare up again, causing more extensive damage to the new wing. Authorities said on Tuesday that the fire had finally been brought under control. The blaze also caused the partial collapse of the roof in the old wing, which dates back to 8084 and houses the upper chamber, the National Council of Provinces. Officials have said important sections of the complex were saved, including a museum with artworks and heritage objects. But it will take a lot of rehabilitation to get the buildings back to where it was, according to a fire officer. We have some good news for you. Canada announced two agreements totaling to $31.5 billion to compensate First Nations children who were taken from their families and put into the child welfare system and to reform the system that removed and deprived them of services they needed. If finalised, it could be the biggest settlement of its kind in Canadian history. $40 billion Canadian dollars towards fixing a discriminatory child welfare system and the First Nation children that it affected, around 28 billion euros. I'm very pleased to announce that Canada and the parties have reached two significant agreements in principle. One that provides fair and equitable compensation to First Nations children and families harmed by discriminatory underfunding and the other addressing the long-term reform that's needed for the First Nations Child and Family Services Program. Almost 15 years ago, First Nation rights groups lodged a complaint against the federal government. 
Canada's Human Rights Tribunal found that discriminatory underfunding on reserves had led to a disproportionate number of First Nations children being taken from their homes and put into foster care. In a 2016 ruling, Ottawa was ordered to pay 40,000 Canadian dollars to each individual affected by the country's discriminatory child welfare system. However, the government is appealing that decision. But on Tuesday, Canada's Justice Minister said Ottawa would drop its appeals once agreements on this new settlement are finalised in the coming months. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The world number one and anti vax endorser Novak Djokovic has been granted a special medical exemption by two independent bodies who cleared him to play the Australian Open. This has received mixed reactions from his competition and the general public, with many accusing him of receiving special treatment. In what many economists attribute to be a result of the pandemic, a large portion of the workforce in the US has moved away from mainstream jobs and entrepreneurial work from home endeavors. This has resulted with an eight digit figure of job vacancies. Thousands of cars were brought to a standstill after a massive storm dropped a foot of snow, rendering roads crews ineffective and confined thousands of their cars overnight in freezing temperatures. Hyundai Motor Group saw a 19% increase in the US market from 2020. The South Korean automaker's performance in 2021 has hailed as being highly successful in the US sales division. A bluefin tuna sold for around 16.88 million yen at the annual New Year tuna auction held by Tokyo's largest fish market, marking a third consecutive year since the drop of the auction's highest bidder. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow on more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. Well, despite all odds and with only 30 days to go, China is now well prepared for the 2022 Winter Olympics. We are leaving you tonight with spectacular visuals of the preparations for the Games. Take care and have a good night.